this. We've got this is the song. And we've got the actual song. So I'll get everything lined up here. And you can just listen to this one if you wish. I won't make you sing it. Let's see, here's my iTunes. And we're off. Translation. Translation. The most intricate thing. Tim does a great job on that. So um, enough of translation. Let us move on uh, from translation now and talk about uh, biotechnology. I intend to stop a little early today. I'm actually in very good shape with things, and I think you've been hit with a lot of information. I'm sure you probably could use a few extra minutes to study for the exam. That might be just the thing that pushes, pushes you over that, that limit to get an A. So I promise I will stop a little bit early today. Okay. Well, when we talk about biotechnology, that's something that we, we hear the word and we think, wow, it's very high tech, it's very uh, blah, blah, blah. But in fact, biotechnology has been around for as long as human beings have been around. All right? Making a bread is biotechnology. Making a wine is biotechnology. Okay? Whenever we have used a living organism, to do something for us, we've employed biotechnology. Okay? Yeast make bread, yeast make wine, cheese. Okay? All these things are examples of biotechnology. Modern biotechnology exploits other organisms than we have traditionally used, usually bacteria, but not always bacteria, exploit other organisms than we've used to make products that we want. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about some of the techniques that we use in biotechnology. Um, and as I said, I'll finish a little bit early. OK. Well, um, you've seen this one. What's this? OK. So we've got electrophoresis. We use uh, agarose gel electrophoresis to separate fragments of DNA, or we use polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis to celebrate, uh, separate fragments of protein. Okay. And you've seen all this before, so that, that's nothing new that we haven't talked about before. This is a very, these are very common tools that we would have in biotechnology. Um, that's, what is that? Is it, can anybody see from that figure? It's a little hard to see. Um, it is an x-ray, but it's, but it's an x-ray film, at least. Anybody have any idea what it looks like? 2D gel electrophoresis. Yeah. So that's actually, it's a terrible, terrible picture, but it's actually 2D gel electrophoresis. Um, and let's see. Now, let's talk about some things that we haven't talked about before. So one of the um, most important things, or one of the most important tools that brought about modern biotechnology was a class of enzymes known as restriction endonucleases. You more commonly hear them referred to as restriction enzymes. And that's fine, too. Restriction endonucleases or restriction enzymes. 
These guys are enzymes that are found in bacteria. And they have a very, very cool um, use. What they do is they cut DNA at a specific sequence of bases. They cut DNA at a specific sequence of bases. Now, if you think about this, this seems to be an odd thing for an organism to have. Why should a bacterium have a, an enzyme that would chop up its own DNA? You say, well, it doesn't have that sequence in its DNA. As a matter of fact, for most bacteria, they have hundreds of copies of that sequence in their DNA. Are the bacteria suicidal? What's going on? Well, it turns out that the bacteria protect themselves from cutting their own DNA by using an enzyme called a methylase. So this enzyme that you see above, okay, this restriction enzyme, recognizes the sequence GAATTC. Wherever that, in, that sequence appears, the restriction enzyme will cut it unless there's a methyl group that's been placed on it. So the methyl goes on to, I believe it's the A, and if there's an, a methyl group sitting on that A, then the restriction enzyme will not cut it. Yes, ma'am? So the, en which one? The, the, okay, so bacteria protect themselves from cutting their own DNA by using something called a methylase, M-E-T-H-Y-L-A-S-E, a methylase. So we've got two different enzymes. One enzyme that cuts, one enzyme that prevents cutting. So bacteria, when they become a little baby bacterium, they start making the methylase. The methylase goes out, and every time it finds, in this case, a GAATTC, and there are many different enzymes, but when it finds a GAATTC, the methylase says, OK, I'm going to put a methyl group on there because this is my stuff. I'm going to protect my DNA from cutting. Then when a restriction enzyme that recognizes that comes along, it can't cut it. It's protected. Okay? Well, what, of what use is that? Well, the use is if a virus comes along, and viruses that infect bacteria are called bacteriophages, if a virus comes along and injects its DNA into <coughs> the bacterium, that DNA will not be methylated. That DNA will have sequences like GAATTC. And the restriction enzymes will chop it to pieces. We can think of this as a bacterial defense system against viruses. That's the reason that the bacteria have it, to protect themselves from viruses. Now, the question always arises, well, what if the methylase gets there first? Is the virus protected? The answer is yes, it is. Okay? It's not a perfect system. If the, if the enzyme, if the restriction enzyme gets there first, the restriction enzyme cuts it up, the bacterial, I'm sorry, the bacteriophage is dead. If the methylase gets there first, it protects the virus against the being cut, and it will, in fact, allow the virus to reproduce. Make sense? The methylase has no way of knowing where the sequence came from. All the, all the methylase can do is recognize, here's a sequence methylated. Yeah. Yes, ma'am? Do restriction enzymes also cut RNA? For the most part, no. There are a couple rare ones that will actually cut RNA, but in general, restriction enzymes will only cut DNA. Cutting RNA would actually be another nice defense mechanism because there are RNA viruses that infect bacteria. So, but there are other also um, uh, RNA cutting enzymes that are different. So that, 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 that's probably a protection there as well. Okay, makes sense? So this, uh, and I should also give you a name. This, this is called a restriction modification system. Restriction slash modification. The modification, of course, being provided by the methylase. So restriction modification systems protect the bacterium against outside viruses. We don't have anything like this in our cells. We don't have anything like this in our cells. OK. There is the protection, you can see. 
and cleavage sites. There are hundreds of different enzymes. Each bacterium tends to have one. Some of them have two, but most of them only have about one. Different enzymes recognize different sites. So here was the one I showed you before, EcoR1, that recognizes GAATTC. If I wanted to cut at a GGATTC, a GGATCC, I would use a BAMH1, etc. So these are tools that I can take a big honking piece of DNA in the laboratory and chop it into manageable fragments that I can work with. Manageable fragments that I can work with. And I'll show you an application of that in just a little bit. Yes, sir. Is there, like, do some of them cut on specific places, maybe like where energy is made, like genes that do certain things? So his question is, are the, are the enzymes targeted for specific things like genes where, en where energy is made? And the answer is no. They, all they recognize are sequences. So there's, there's not any targeting of specific things, no. So we could cut and then just have no effect. It could just be the gene in the virus that just doesn't really do anything. It's a good question. In general, the frequency of cutting is such that it will cut most viruses into several pieces. And that's usually sufficient to inactivate them. So it doesn't leave anything behind that would allow the virus to do its thing. If you cut, for example, if you look at this guy, HPA2, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, HPA2, it recognizes a four-base sequence. If you do the math, you see that on average, a, such a sequence occurs once every 256 bases. So if you had a virus that was, say, 40,000 nucleotides long, it's going to get chopped into little tiny pieces for the most part. Okay. All right, so those are the restriction enzymes. We'll see how they become useful uh, in the, the laboratory. Um, in fact, right here, okay? Now, before I tell you about how they're useful, I have to tell you about another very important tool for us in the biotechnology laboratory. And this tool is a small circular DNA that's also found in bacteria. It's not found in us. Bacteria have little tiny circles of DNA that are apart from their main big chromosomal DNA. Remember, their big chromosome is a big circle. The bacterial chromosome DNA in E. coli is about 6 million base pairs long. Bacteria have smaller circular DNAs called plasmids. So the smaller circles are called plasmids. And they may be on the order of a couple of thousand to maybe 5,000 base pairs long, much, much smaller than the chromosome. Okay? Why do bacteria have plasmids? Well, plasmids generally carry useful genes. And you might wonder, well, why aren't those genes in the bacterial chromosome? And the answer is because they're contained on a plasmid, they can frequently be donated back and forth between different bacteria. They allow for the movement of genes. So one of the ways, for example, that antibiotic resistance gets spread is one bacterium will figure out how to, how to um, resist the antibiotic with a gene. It'll have that gene on a plasmid, and that plasmid will get passed to other bacteria. And so it can very quickly move through the, um, um, the environment. Okay? Now, in the laboratory, we use plasmids that have been disabled so that they cannot be passed. That's one important thing about laboratory plasmids. We've disabled them so they can't be passed from one cell to the next cell. That's very important because we, we use in the laboratory plasmids that have resistance to antibiotics. We don't want to be spreading that resistance out into the environment. So the, the, the laboratory plasmids are modified so that they don't have those sequences. So one bacterium can't pass it on to another one, for example. Okay. Now, so let's think about what we can do with these plasmids. Well, the advantage of plasmids is they're fairly small, they're fairly easy to work with, and we can put them into bacteria very easily. They're small, they're easy to work with, and we can put them into bacteria very easily. I could teach each of you how to put a plasmid into bacterium, and we could all do one in this class uh, in the matter of a few minutes and see the results tomorrow. Okay? It's very, very simple technique to do that. Now, what do we care about that? Well, what we care about that 